Krishna, Mission Impossible today. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. It's the third time's always lucky. It's the third time I tried to <coughs> get going on this video, working up to the point of hearing about Krishna, and three times, two times now, interrupted uh, technical stuff. First, the water guy, I mean, the uh, electric people, we got to talk to you about your meter. Now, a termite guy is here. We got to look at your, your termite traps, make sure. Anyway, I'm waiting for the water guy, but he's the one that hasn't arrived yet. So, we're in the middle of that little story, and uh, hopefully, I can finish it before something else happens. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, 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 Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Ram Rama, Hare Hare. <laughs> so, yeah, so now the cow and the calf are in the house. See the house, the wife was complaining, the house is too small, the house is too small. It was driving the husband crazy. So he went to a guru, and the guru said, put a cow in the house. Seemed preposterous, but he did it. And then, of course, it made things even worse. So then the wife says, go back and tell him it's not working. So now he went back and he says, what should I do now? So he put a calf in the house. Okay, so we're at the point where now there's a cow and a calf in a very small house. <clears throat> and the wife is livid. She's ready to kill somebody. Understandably so. <laughs> It's pretty hard to keep clean, keep the house, you know, you get a cow and a calf in a small house. So he went running back to the to the, the guru, like practically immediately. He says, look, this is terrible. We're going to do something. So then the saintly person says, okay, now take the cow and the calf out of the house. So he ran back, he took the cow out, he took the calf out. And the wife goes, oh, this is so nice. There's so much room in here now. <laughs> yeah, these stories are so, they're so much fun. You know, it's just, she didn't complain anymore about the house being too small. Was so much room now. <laughs> hey, Krishna! I mean, I think Krishna deals with us sometimes like that, you know. Hey, Krishna! He really makes things impossible and then he takes it away, and then we're, oh, this is so nice now. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. <clears throat> I think that happens with relationships. Like, I need somebody, I need somebody, I need somebody. And then Krishna sends somebody, like putting the cow and the calf in the house. And it's nothing but a headache and it's awful. And it's like, and then Krishna, you know, takes it away. And you go, oh, this is so nice. And then you're like free to actually... You get more of a relationship with Krishna. You hear more about Krishna. I was thinking about that this morning, that <clears throat> this human form, we are so fortunate to have this human human body. Prabhupada said that, and we can understand it, the truth of it, that it's a great tragedy. Somebody has a human form and they miss the opportunity. I miss the opportunity of Krishna consciousness. A great tragedy. Yeah. 
Hmm. Hare Krishna, I need to take this more seriously so that the people I come in contact with, yeah, try to share something, Krishna. Well, at least I wear tilak, you know. It's very powerful. Tilak's very potent. <clears throat> something, anyway. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare 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 Rama, Hare Rama. <clears throat> Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. So we'll have this relationship and it's nothing but a headache. And then when it changes, we're like, oh, so nice. Oh, oh Krishna, thank you. But I, I was thinking how this human form, one of the, I don't, it may be the most wonderful uh, gift is the ability to speak and chant. And not just the ability to speak and chant, but Krishna is giving us the tools to be able to speak about him. Be able to hear and chant about the personality of Godhead. What a what a great gift. Not only the ability to, but giving us the language to do it. I don't mean like English or French or Spanish or right? the language. The spiritual language to use words in whatever our language, material language, is to be able to glorify, magnify, personality of God. What a wonderful, wonderful gift. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. And of course, uh, the topmost is the mantra. <laughs> you don't need like a big philosophical, intellectual brain. All you need is the vibration. Hare Krishna. But if you have that kind of brain where you like to analyze and think and, to, and you know, that's good too. Because without doing that, without actually hearing and understanding about Krishna as he is, everything can degrade very quickly into uh, just sense gratification. You know, you've seen Krishna as an ordinary person and, and then it's really just about sex and it's really just about, you know, it can degrade pretty quickly into that. And it has from time to time, and it does. So it's important to be able to have the language to be able to present Krishna as he is, the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In all of his aspects, his greatness, it's important to have a sense of that. That's a protection falling into illusion again. <laughs> Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare. It's important to hear these messages. It's important to hear Bhagavad Gita. It's important to study these scriptures. It is important to take shelter of the knowledge in the spirit. <laughs> what is it? Um, religion without devotion is, how did Prabhupada say that? We keep trying to balance it out. Um, 
Oh, knowledge without religion is speculation. Religion meaning devotion. And religion without knowledge is fanaticism or ritualistic, ritualistic stuff. So they both have to be there. Spirit and the knowledge, the truth, the spirit and the knowledge, both there. Okay, it's time. It's time for Krishna. And this is the story of King Nriga. This is Krishna book. The summary study of the 10th canto of the Bhagavatam by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, who at a very advanced age set off on a worldwide mission to spread Krishna consciousness under the order of his spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who specifically asked him, please get this message out of India. <laughs> get it out. Especially if you write books in English, that will have a big impact because the English-speaking world is very influential on the rest of the world because of military strength, economic strength, like this. They're very influential and powerful. So get it out, especially in English. He took that very seriously, and he did it. He didn't know if he would be able to finish the Bhagavatam. He's advanced to age. So he made sure that he did the 10th canto complete in a summary study. And then he worked on the other nine cantos leading up to the tenth canto. And he did part of the tenth canto in his way of doing things with word for word and transliterations and elaborate purports, but only up to a certain point. And then he disappeared. He never left Vrindavan. <laughs> you know, that's as far as he got in um, the pastime of Krishna with Lord Brahman. And, and stealing the coward boys, and then he disappeared. So, he only got to the point of Vrindavan in the 10th canto. There are 12 cantos. One of his disciples has translated and given purports, but there's some controversy over. It's unauthorized or whatever. Anyway, whatever. There you go, sir. Prabhupada got to part of the 10th canto, but this is the full 10th canto. So this is the story of King Riga. <clears throat> Once the family members of Lord Krishna, such as Samba, Pradumna, Charubanu, and Gada, all princes of the Yadu dynasty, went for a long picnic in the forest near Dwarka. In the course of their excursion, all of them became thirsty. And so they began to try to find out where water was available in the forest. When they approached a well, they found that there was no water in it, but on the contrary, within the well was a wonderful living entity. It was a large lizard. And all of them became astonished to see such a wonderful animal. Large lizard. Kind of like a dinosaur or something. <laughs> they could understand that the animal was trapped, could not escape by its own effort. So out of compassion, they tried to take the large lizard out of the well. Unfortunately, they could not get the lizard out, even though they tried to do so in many ways. So, it doesn't say how old the boys were, but it appears that they were young, that they weren't married yet, that they were just um, young boys, sons of the different queens of Krishna, and they all went on a picnic. 
When the princes returned home, their story was narrated before Lord Krishna. Lord Krishna is the friend of all living entities. Therefore, after hearing the appeal from his sons, he personally went to the well and easily got the lizard out simply by extending his left hand. Immediately upon being touched by the hand of Lord Krishna, the great lizard gave up its former shape and appeared as a beautiful demigod. Okay, so there it is again. By the touch of Krishna, there's a transformation. See, I've been looking at Jambavati, and she's the daughter of a very unusual living being, living in a cave in a forest, compared to a gorilla or a bear. Um, Prabhupada said, a human, but of a very uncultured class. And she's a daughter, okay? And he's a pure devotee, her father, Jambavan, and he's giving his daughter out of love for Krishna, to Krishna. So it's like, what does she look like, you know? Here, this is a lizard in a well, and by the touch of Krishna, he regains his beautiful demigod body by the touch of Krishna. Kubja. She was deformed, hunchback, serving Kamsa. But when she met Krishna, she said, forget Kamsa. I, I want this one. I want to serve this one. And by her touch, he stepped on her feet, pulled her up by the cheeks. By her touch, all her deformities went away and she became a gorgeous female form, perfectly suited for a conjugal relationship with Krishna, which was her desire. So Krishna fulfilled her desire and gave her the form that was suitable for that kind of a relationship. So by the touch of Krishna, there's a transformation. Here it is again. By the touch of Krishna's hand, the great lizard gave up its former shape and appeared as a beautiful demigod, <coughs> an inhabitant of the heavenly planets. His bodily complexion glittered like molten gold. He was decorated with fine garments, and he wore costly ornaments around his neck. So when Krishna accepted Jambavani, because of Jambavan's devotion, Krishna says, Bhagavad Gita, they offer me with love and devotion, I'll accept. Not just food, but anything. You can offer Krishna yourself. You can offer Krishna your house as his house. You can offer Krishna your money. He'll take your money if offered in devotion. And when you give something to Krishna, he returns it a million fold. So it's a good investment. And even, and even you know, giving his daughter out of love and devotion. And Krishna accepts. When he accepts Jamabadi, you don't think by the touch of Krishna there wasn't some, some transformation? So, whatever she was before, it doesn't matter. <laughs> in one sense, it matters in that it shows the power of the touch of Krishna. That part matters. And it shows the potency of the devotee the pure devotee, like Jambavan. That matters. But don't think there's some transformation? Hare Krishna. How the demigod had been obliged to accept the body of a lizard was not a secret to Lord Krishna. But still, for others, information, for others' information, the Lord inquired. Okay, so Krishna knew why the demigod was stuck in the well, but he's asking so that it can be spoken and others can understand. Krishna says, My dear fortunate demigod, now I see that your body is so beautiful and lustrous. Who are you? We can guess that you are one of the best demigods in the heavenly planets. All good fortune to you. I think that you are not meant to be in this situation. It must be due to the result of your past activities that you have been put into the species of lizard life. Still, I want to hear from you how you were put into this position 
If you think that you can disclose this secret, then please tell us your identity. <clears throat> Actually, this large lizard was King Riga. When he was questioned by the Supreme Personality of Godhead, he immediately bowed down before the Lord, touching the, gro the ground, touching the helmet on his head to the ground, which was as dazzling as the sunshine. In this way, he first of all offered his respectful obeisances unto the Supreme Lord, and then said, My dear Lord, I am the son of King Ikshvaku, and am King Riga. If you have ever taken account of all charitably disposed men, I am sure that you must have heard my name. My Lord, you are the witness. You are aware of every bit of work done by the living entities, past, present, and future. Nothing can be hidden from your eternal cognizance. Still, you have ordered me to explain my history, and I shall therefore narrate the full story. So he is the son of King Ikshvaku. And Ikshvaku, is he the son of the he's, I think he's the son of the sun god. Ikshvaku? Who is Ikshvaku? Come on, Google knows. Google knows everything. Google knows who Ikshvaku is. Ikshvaku. He even knows I, Google even knows I spelt it wrong. And he's correcting my spelling. <laughs> ah, Krishna. Of course it's not. Of course it's not that simple. Oh, okay, he's the son of Manu. Okay. Because that's Gita, that's Bhagavad Gita. I just let me just find if it's in the Bhagavad Gita. Sometimes Google knows too much and it's all mishmash. Okay. Uh oops, Bhagavad Gita. Okay. I'll put Manu in. Let's see in the search. Yeah, here we go. Hare Krishna. No, no. Okay. <clears throat> Spoken to the sun god. Okay. The sun god explained to Manu, and Manu explained it to Ishvaku. So here, Ishvaku, uh, uh, King Riga says, he's a son of Ishvaku. And Ishvaku is in line of disciplic succession from the sun god, which wears, where the Bhagavad Gita was originally spoken by the sun god, who then spoke it in disciplic succession to Manu, and evidently it shredded Dave Manu, a particular Manu, and then Manu explained it to Ichvaku, this is his disciplic succession, and Nriga is the son of Ichvaku. Okay, it's pretty high up there, isn't he? Okay. Actually, this large lizard was King Riga and uh, touched his helmet to the ground. I am the son of King Ikshvaku and am King Riga. King Riga proceeded to narrate the history of his degradation caused by his karmakanda activities. He was very charitably disposed and had given away so many cows that he said the number was equal to the amount of dust on the earth, the stars in the sky, and the rainfall. Ooh, according to the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies, a man who is charitably disposed 
is commanded to give cows to the Brahmins. From King Riga's statement, it appears that he followed this principle earnestly. However, as a result of a slight discrepancy in his action, he was forced to take birth as a lizard. Therefore, it is recommended by the Lord in the Bhagavad Gita that one who is charitably disposed and desires to derive the benefit of his charity should offer his gifts to please Krishna. So King Riga was doing his charity with the uh, goal of elevation to the higher planets. He was doing karma kind of sacrifices. And he was very charitable because he wanted to go to the higher planets. But there was a tiny little discrepancy. See, with Krishna, that doesn't happen. Krishna accepts the love and devotion and he carries what they lack and preserves what they have for someone who makes the offering to Krishna. But in Karmakanda, it's very strict. And if there's even the slightest little deviation, you get a reaction because it's still under this, the jurisdiction of the modes of material energy and his actions and reactions. So he was trying to follow this. He was getting charity like anything. But to give charity means to perform pious activities. As a result of pious activities, one may be elevated to the higher planets. But promotion to the heavenly planets is no guarantee that one will never fall down. Rather, from the example of King Riga, it is definitely proved that fruit of activities, even if they are very pious, cannot give us eternal blissful as stated in Bhagavad Gita, the result of work, either pious or impious, is sure to bind a man unless it is discharged as yajna, sacrifice, on behalf of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. <clears throat> King Riga continued to say that the cows given in charity were not ordinary cows. Each one was very young and had given birth to only one calf. They were full of milk, very peaceful and healthy. All the cows were purchased with money that had been earned legally. Furthermore, their horns were gold-plated, their hooves were bedecked with silver plates, and they were covered with silken wrappers which were embroidered with pearls and necklaces. He stated that these valuably decorated cows were not given to any worthless person, but were distributed to the first-class brahmanas, whom he had decorated with nice garments and gold ornaments. The brahmins were well qualified. None of them were rich, and their family members were always in want of the necessities of life. A real brahmin never hoards money for a luxurious life, like the chatriyas or the vaishyas but always keeps himself in a poverty-stricken condition, knowing that money diverts the mind to materialistic ways of life. To live in this way is the vow of a qualified brahmana. And all of these brahmanas were well situated in that exalted vow. They were well learned in Vedic knowledge. They executed the required austerities and penances in their lives and were liberal meeting the standard of qualified brahmanas. <clears throat> they were equally friendly to everyone. Above all, they were young and quite fit to act as qualified brahmanas. Besides the cows, they were also given land, gold, houses, horses, and elephants. Well, there goes the, the poverty condition. <laughs> Unless they, in turn, gave them away. But now they're doing quite well now. Those who were not married were given wives, maidservants, grain, silver, utensils, garments, jewels, household furniture, chariots, etc. This charity was nicely performed as a sacrifice according to the Vedic rituals. But they had good training, so when they had all these things, 
they weren't likely to be diverted by them because they obviously had <coughs> some some sound training in a life of poverty and a vow of whatever vows they had taken for self-control. They obviously uh, had sufficient training. So when they received all these things, they, their minds were diverted, most likely. The king also stated that not only had he bestowed gifts on the Brahmanas, but he had performed other pious activities, such as digging a well, planting trees on the roadside, and installing ponds on the highway. Boy, this king was really something, and he was like, he was almost Krishna, fulfilling everyone's desires. <laughs> or Santa Claus or something. He was... <laughs> Oh, he was just... The king continued, In spite of all of this, unfortunately, one of the Brahmanas' cows chanced to enter amongst my other cows. Not knowing this, I again gave it in charity to another Brahmana. As the cow was being taken away by the Brahmana, its former master claimed it as his own stating, This cow was formerly given to me, so how is it that you are taking it away? Thus, there was arguing and fighting between the two Brahmanas, and they came before me and charged that I had taken back a cow that I had previously given in charity. To give something to someone and then take it away is considered a great sin, especially in dealing with a Brahmana. When both the Brahmanas charged the king with the same complaint, he was simply puzzled as to how it had happened. Therefore, with great humility, the king offered each of them 100,000 cows in exchange for the one cow that was causing the fight between them. He prayed to them that he was their servant and that they had been some mistake. Thus, in order to rectify it, he prayed that they would be very kind upon him and accept his offer in exchange for the cow. The king fervently appealed to the Brahmanas not to cause his downfall into hell because of this mistake. He was so meticulous in everything he did, now he's got this one thing. He wants to go to the heavenly planets in this one thing. A Brahmanish property is called Brahmasva, and according to Manu's law, it cannot be acquired even by the government. Both Brahmanas insisted that the cow was theirs and could not be taken back under any circumstance. Neither of them agreed to exchange it for 100,000 cows. Thus, disagreeing with the king's proposal, both Brahmanas left the palace in anger thinking that their lawful position had been usurped. So it really wasn't about the cow so much for those Brahmanas. It was about the Brahminical powers. That if they agreed to this other deal, then their Brahminical standing would be compromised. Because you can't take anything. Even the government can't take the possession of a cow. This is part of their power. Brahminical power, the Brahminical stature. Pra Brahmins were so powerful then. Now there really aren't any Brahmins, not really. But at that time there were Brahmins and they were very, very powerful. Um, by reciting a mantra, an old animal could go into a fire and come out with a rejuvenated body. They were that powerful with mantras. So they were very angry. And they, because their Brahminical stature was being compromised if they accepted a deal. It was like a business deal. Brahminas don't do business. You can't like buy them off, you know, and they were very angry and upset. And they left angry. After this incident, when the time came for the king to give up his body, he was taken before Yamaraj, the superintendent of death. 
Yamaraj asked him whether he wanted to first enjoy the results of his pious activities or first suffer the results of his impious activities. Yamaraj hinted that since the king had executed so many pious activities and charities, the limit of Riga's enjoyment would be unknown to him. He wouldn't know the limit of his uh, enjoyment. There was practically no end to the king's material happiness. But in spite of this, he was bewildered. He decided to first suffer the results of his impious activities and then to accept the results of his pious activities. So first he was going to get this thing out of the way so that his, not, not only would it be uh, the, the limit of his pleasures couldn't be known, but there wouldn't even be anything nagging him in, in the back of his mind about some impious thing might come sometime. That would be gone. He was going to get rid of that. So his path would be totally clear for material enjoyment on the heavenly planet. He decided to first suffer the results of his impious activities and then accept the results of his pious activities. Therefore, Yamaraj immediately turned him into a lizard. <laughs> Poof. <clears throat> King Riga had remained in a well as a lizard for a very long time. Okay, I, I'm going to stop here. Looks like it might be a stopping point. Uh, because Krishna's pulled him out of the well, and he's now in his demigod body, and he's telling his story. Krishna knew already what happened, but it's so that others, like us, could hear the story of this king, King Rita. So I'll just stop there. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna, Krishna. Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama. Ram Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Krishna, Krishna. Hari 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 Rama Hari Rama 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 Hari 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 Krishna Hari Krishna Wow Krishna consciousness so much another cliffhanger <laughs> it's like the woman tied to the railroad tracks and the train is coming and, so, and next week we will <laughs> next time we will in the next episode it's like that with Krishna though isn't it isn't it like that with Krishna? Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna. Hare Bhakti, Hare Krishna.